Pentagon. Oh my god, Pentagon. <laughs> Hey, Michelle. Hey, hey, hey. Ho, ho, ho. We are almost there. (laughs) It's Christmas. Christmas. Almost. What did you say? Christmas. Christmas. Amazing. You sound like Margarita Prakatan. Prakatan. She's very Christmassy. Bless her. Rest in peace, Margarita. As we know, she passed away. So did Clive James. They can be in heaven having a party together or not. As we found out, they don't get on. No, they do not. But we do. We, we get, get on. on. And, and it's very sad. We're not in the same upstairs downstairs anymore. We're not in an up... Uh, what's it called? Uptown girl situation, I was going to say, but it's not Uptown girl. <laughs> Downton Abbey was what I was thinking of. <laughs> oh, yes. Hang on. So are you posh or are you? Yeah, I'm upstairs. You're always oh, downstairs. Okay. Yeah. Because I married in. I married into the oh. family. <laughs> yeah, I'm basically the help. Yeah, well, you were always cleaning the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> I love a sponge. I love you a sure cleaning do. product. <laughs> and Michelle was very kind. She secretly left behind a packet of magic sponges just for me to use. <laughs> Is that a message? Honestly, everyone needs one. If I could mail a packet of magic sponge to every single eavesdropper, it would fill my heart with Christmas joys. Well, instead, they just get an episode. That's your Christmas gift. But what a great idea for merch, Michelle, our own range of cleaning oh. products. Maybe that's what we should be doing. That is amazing. Would you buy eavesdropping sponges? Would you buy eavesdropping toilet tongue? Toilet tongue. tongue. <laughs> and if you don't know what we're talking about, you'll have to go back a few episodes. There's a cleaning episode. Indeed. Look in the back catalogue. Anyway, Michelle, what have we got this week? Um, We had some correspondence. Somebody wrote in. Yes, they did, Natty J. Thank you for emailing, Natty. We love it when you write in. And when you write in, you get shout outs. Shout out. Shout out. Shout out. You're getting a shout out. You do indeed. And Natty J, she. I mean, I can't remember everything she said, but she did say we were her favourite podcast. Oh, she wishes thanks, there Matt. was more than two eps, well, one ep a week. She wants two eps a week is what she said. She wants two episodes a week. Now, Nat, we'd love to provide that. Um, but as you pointed out in your email, we're a bit thin on the ground for topics. So please write in with more interesting things that we can talk about. Conversation starters. That's what we need. Well, Natty J, look, she's not a fan of the poo and the puke stories. Well, fair enough. No, she loves the paranormal stuff, and we do have an ep for you. Today. Natty J, indeed. But you know what? To be fair, we did have other comments from people who loved the puke episode. <laughs> yes, and do you know what? I've had a few comments real time. No one wrote in. They've just spoken to me who've listened and said, oh, what about the time I spewed in my husband's <laughs> construction helmet? That person will remain nameless for now, but let's just say her husband is very handy with the tools and she was very handy with his helmet one evening when she'd had a little bit too much Christmas cheer, oh, no. crawling over on her hands and knees to find the first thing she could find to vomit into and it happened to be her husband's construction helmet. I've said that word three times now. Inventive. Yeah. I, I give that I give that a, an eight. I reckon that's, that's pretty a, good. That's a firm eight, Yannicka. Oh, did I say her name? <laughs> <laughs> I spoke to Jen. Was she all right with, about picking up her panties and going? Did she remember ever saying that? She said, I never said pick up your panties and go. But she said, do you know what? If I did, if I did win a house, I would. I would just pick up my panties and go. So she never said it, but now she has. Now she has from the lips of Jen. She has said, pick up your panties and go. So, Michelle, tell me, what are we talking about this week to satisfy Natty J's desire for the paranormal, the supernatural and all that stuff that we love to talk about? So, because we are giving you Christmas every Wednesday in December. Oh, yes, because it's still (laughs) Christmas. And you know what, guys? Any day now, he's sliding into your chimney. Those big (laughs) black boots, the coal-ridden beard. (laughs) The big man himself. One, two, three. It's Christmas every Wednesday in December. Drop the me. So will you drop with me? Drop, drop, drop. Sexy Santa in a place to play to play. What a hoot! What a hoot! 
straight into your DMs. He's coming at you. Big Santa. However, according to a self-proclaimed UFO expert in West London, who also happens to be an ex-cabbie, he reckons we have Christmas all wrong. Oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah. Did he write in? Is he someone we know? No. he's. Oh. I don't know any ex-cabbies. Do you? I know a cabbie. Do you? Yeah. Well, you also know a postie. <laughs> I know. Yes. And you know my postie now. Shout out Dan, the hot postie <laughs> from my hood. <laughs> no, look, this is a guy called Richard Lawrence. Now, he's super into his alien conspiracy theories. He sounds he's great. He's written 11 books, right? Oh. What's his name? Richard Lawrence. Yes. The West London cabbie. West London cabbie, UFO expert. He says... The Star of Bethlehem Mm -hmm. is actually an alien spaceship. Right, yep. Christmas is actually in March. And Jesus was an extraterrestrial from Venus. Well, that makes sense. Have you heard all this before? No, I haven't. I'm just nodding along. I'm just nodding along. (laughs) Well, you know, you don't get to my age without, you know, hearing a few wacky out there potential (laughs) theories on creation and whatnot. Well, look, he's the executive secretary of the Aetherius Society, which is an international spiritual organization. So it's not just the secretary and the head man. Is he also the only member? No, I don't know. It could be. Did you do your research, Michelle? (laughs) No, I did not. Do they exist? It sounds like a real thing. And look, it's all based on the teachings of a guy called Dr. George King, who says he was contacted in 1954 by aliens when he was drying dishes in his small rented flat in Fulham. Oh, this sounds like the Rielian guy, though. He was also a messenger. for. He was from God, though. No, he was from aliens. He was from aliens. Look, they're all, maybe they're all connected somehow. But this Dr. King, he wrote down loads of what the extraterrestrials told him. Oh, I can't and wait And he's hear. passed it all on to Richard. And now he's told Richard, we've been getting some things wrong about Christmas, which is, hmm. like I said, Jesus is basically an alien. Yeah. So he's from Venus. He's a great cosmic intelligence. Yeah. And benevolent and he was sent to help out humanity along with buddha gandhi and sophocles they're all one and the same they're all aliens sent to help us now the star of bethlehem was an alien spaceship it's a christmas ufo and he says that based on the bible the star of bethlehem was witnessed by three wise men and it guided them to a specific place because and it couldn't have been a star because stars don't move was the star of bethlehem moving Well, it guided them to Jesus, apparently. I thought it was in a fixed point in the sky. This is how I read it. Not read it, but was taught it and in Sunday school back in the day. It was just a big bright light in the sky and they followed it. But I didn't think it was, I didn't think it was like moving around in front of their faces. No, not not in front of their faces, but apparently the star was guiding them to little baby Jesus in that, like in the hay or wherever he was with with the Virgin Mary and bloody blah, blah. We weren't there, were we? So we could just have to go with that. Anything's possible. Well, he says, stars don't move. Meteorites don't hover. It had a pattern. It's an alien ship. All right. Okay. We'll go with that. Yeah. And he says, Christmas is actually in March. March 15, to be precise. Because, first of all, the aliens told Dr. King, March 15, And apparently in the Bible, there are some clues, mainly that the shepherds were watching their flocks by night. But they couldn't have been doing that on December 25, he says, because it's a spring thing. Oh, okay. That's it from Richard Lawrence. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Do you know what? Like, you could actually get in touch with him. He's... yeah. Well, I might get picked up by him one day. When, oh. Next time I stick my thumb out. <laughs> <laughs> Although I get exclusively get Ubers, so all public transport. So there you go. We've been getting Christmas all wrong. Oh, okay. Well, good to know. But do you know what? Apparently, December has been a bumper month for UFO mm-hmm. sightings all over the world. I heard this too, Michelle. Did you? Yes. Well, I was looking at the National Archives because they've got it all listed because the Ministry of Defence are no longer holding those documents anymore, I believe. We've done a previous episode about lights in the sky and UFOs and UAPs, haven't we? We did. Episode 
episode 30, I think, wow, episode Michelle. 31, actually. Oh, aren't you clever off the top of your head looking at a note on the side? Huh? I am, but I've lost the note. I'm pretty Never sure mind. it was episode 31. Anyway, Well, I think it was <laughs> like, called something like UAPs or something like that, if you want to go back and listen. But you can find all of the documents at the National Archives, which is okay. there for all to see. Well, first of all, I wanted to talk, before we go down that road, I wanted to talk about the fact that two weeks ago on December 8, US Congress passed a landmark defence bill to set up a new UFO office. Oh. Yeah, which I guess is kind of like a UFO task force. Right. And all this new task force is going to be doing is investigating UFOs. Amazing. Mainly, I think to see if they pose any kind of, you know, threat. And threat? actually, threat is a word that they used. Yeah, because that's what they cared about when we looked at the reports last time, didn't we? All the the, the defence people care about the de- is... The declassified documents were all about yeah. defence. Threats and, and defence, threats. yeah. So they used the word threat. And, you know, for me, I just think, like they'd even know if something was a threat before it was too late. And look, and I was reading this article, and this is my favourite bit, the office is also there to oversee any efforts to capture the UFOs. Wow. Like that's even fucking possible because if yeah. UFOs are landing here from God knows where. We haven't caught them yet. No, and they're obviously smarter than that us. That we and- know of. That we know well, of, Michelle. That we know of. Look at you yeah. stirring the pot. <laughs> I mean, they're not going to let us capture them, are they? And look, what what I find really aggressive is is, is the language here because there's no yeah. kind of gentle, oh, we're going to interact with them or, oh, we're going to make contact. No, it's let's capture them. Let's get them, you know. Cut them open. Let's look inside. I know. Well, good luck with that, America. The bill was passed pretty much without a hitch, actually, because, you know, UFOs are a bit of a hot topic in Washington at the moment because they've become less of a weird conspiracy theory thing and more of a debate, like we just talked about, on national security because over the past Mm. few years, more and more US intelligence officials and servicemen have gone on the record saying they've seen weird shit in the sky that they just can't make any sense of. And yes, as we talked about in episode 31, well done. <laughs> with that whole declassified Pentagon, Pentagon, why can't I speak today? Pentagon. <laughs> <laughs> Pentagon. Oh my God, Pentagon. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even been drinking this morning. What's wrong it's with me? It's a bit me? early. <laughs> so with that Pentagon UAP report, they we, we know from before, there are 144 sightings of unidentified aerial phenomena. Phenomena. Not OAPs, yes. but yeah, UAPs. UAPs. These were all sightings by the military since 2004 that still remain unexplained. And the thing with this new UFO office that I find really interesting is that it's going to be a collaboration between the Department of Defense and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. So you're uniting intelligence and the military. But those two, when you look back into any kind of UAP interaction, phenomena, sightings, those two usually are mentioned in any article that you would have done research on this week if you have actually researched, Michelle. (laughs) Well, they are, absolutely. And the thing is, they've never, ever worked together. And now that's what this new office is going to be doing. I think, as, as we just mentioned before, the main focus is going to be whether or not these, you know, weird UFOs are actually like unknown technology from Russia or China. Mm -hmm. And if not, is it aliens? Right. Interestingly, there's a a clause in like the whole bill that says any unclassified reports of what they find have to be released each year on October 31. Oh, that's a good day to look at things like that, isn't it? Isn't that? Isn't that? I mean, that almost sounds like an April 1st joke. But it's October 31st. Yeah. Great. Let's keep an eye open. I know. I know. Let's put an alert in our calendars, Michelle, to always (gasps) have a look and see what unclassified documents have been released. That's a great idea. Pop that in your eye cow right now. Speaking of military UFO sightings, yeah. 
There's a UFO video doing the rounds at the moment that Ooh. was shot at the end of November and uploaded to one of my favorite sites, ufosightingsdaily.com. Uh-huh. And uh, it was put up on December 4 and it's from a, mi- a US military pilot. So he was flying over the South China Sea near Hong Kong. Now, look, I've I've actually seen the video and it's about a minute long and I'll link to it in the show notes. But what you can see is three sets of lights flying above the clouds in unison, kind yeah. of like a squadron, right? And the lights are in straight lines. So imagine three straight lines of four lights per straight line, but yeah. the lights are sort of pulsating and then rotating through from like top to bottom sort of like a puzzle no it's more like a sequence but it's Uh a random sequence and it does not look like any kind of aircraft you've ever seen and you can hear this pilot and he says things like I don't know what this is and that's some weird shit (laughs) and then at the end of the video the lights just vanish they're just gone and he just he's there and he's just like gone boom gone Apparently, the South China Sea is where people have claimed there's a lot of Chinese military activity Mm. happening in that area, Um, which, you know, people online are speculating that might explain the lights. Uh But if it's some kind of Chinese aircraft, what the hell is going on with that? Because these lights don't look like anything you've ever seen before. It's not a plane or anything that I've seen. So who knows? Did you see it? The video? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'll link to it in the show notes. It's okay. They're bizarre. It's really bizarre. In all of the reports, nobody names the pilot. And I, I scoured the internet looking for his name, and it's nowhere to be found. Was he off record? Well, to be honest, I think if he wants anonymity, and honestly, I would too if I just yeah. posted something that I shot over the South China Sea because mm. right now American – China relations are pretty grim. Yeah. No. So I, I get it if he wants to be anonymous. But also... Did you hear about that tennis player that got has been missing since she made what? comments about a leader of the Communist Party no. having sexually interfered with her, although she had an affair with him for many years. Well, there's a famous tennis player, Chinese, who's gone... Yeah, she's gone missing. Fuck. They say. No. That's all I know. Sorry, guys, to just pop that in. It was just on my mind because I read it this morning. Well, look, I I don't know about that. But obviously, you know, things with China are not going well because I came across this blog post, speaking of China, when I was scratching around again on ufosightingsdaily.com that speculated that all those hurricanes in the US recently were actually caused by China. What? Yeah, look, I know that sounds very cute and a little bit conspiracy theory-esque, but I read the post mainly because the headline read, 30 tornadoes hit the US at the same time. Did China use the the HAARP, H-A-A-R-P program to weaponize the weather? Which we've talked about. Yes. Yes. We did. We talked about that. Guys, we might seem like a pair of silly billies who don't know what we're talking about, but we've got our finger on the pulse. If we go missing, you'll know why. We talked about it in episode 36 in our cloud busting episode, oh right? Oh, my God. So I looked into this and the the gist of the article was that on the back of the USA declaring a diplomatic boycott of the China Winter Olympics next year in Seoul, the Chinese who apparently have been moaning in the press that they're pissed off with America because them, you know, pulling out diplomatically caused a chain reaction with the UK and Australia also declaring a diplomatic boycott. And look, I didn't actually see any articles saying China were, you know, threatening to get back at America, but apparently someone has. (laughs) And so, yeah, America. So listen, listen to these dates, people. It's very interesting. America announced on Monday, the 6th of December, that they would send athletes, but no diplomats, to the Games. Then on December 10, a load of these powerful tornadoes tore through Arkansas, Mississippi, Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, Illinois, other states I can't remember. That's a quick turnaround. Yeah. And they killed close to 100 people, all of these tornadoes. They left devastation across hundreds of kilometers. 
But basically, the writer of this blog post is suggesting that China retaliated to the snub by manipulating the weather to smash the states with tornadoes. With how many days between the announcement and the, it was four. Is that right? Four days so between. They announced on the Monday, on the Friday night, around midnight, the tornadoes hit. So that took a week. Five okay. days, give or take. Just wondering how long it takes to power up the heart machine. Well, I don't know. But literally, I think the, a couple of days before, there were all these news reports about how China had used weather control and cloud seeding, which, yes, we have talked about. We know it, it exists. This isn't fake. This no, is this real. is real. Cloud, cloud seeding is a thing. And they yeah. had done it in July, in Beijing, July 2020, to control rain and reduce pollution in Beijing just before they had their Communist Party centenary event. Then the mm. next day, boom, tornadoes. So the oh. blog post then goes on to say that China has the world's largest radio telescope, which is a 500-metre aperture spherical radio telescope, which apparently was declared fully operational in January 2020. So we know that they've had this at least a year and a bit, right? And mm. apparently that is the kind of thing you, you need to create tornadoes. Then it goes on to say in 1993, the US Air Force created the HARP program. And they what they wanted to do was see how they could use electronic waves to manipulate the weather around the world by bouncing a signal up into the sky and bouncing it off the ionos ion ionosphere <laughs> ionosphere yeah that's it <laughs> into a location somewhere on earth right and that this program it went until 2014 and then it shut down but the blogger reckons this program is still going but it's operating secretly right the author of this post is Scott C. Waring. He's actually the guy that owns and runs the UFO da sightingsdaily.com. Okay, right. So the I think this is – he's based in Taiwan and these are his own thoughts and theories, right? He thinks China got their hands on the HARP research and tech and mm -hmm. built their own program to weaponize the weather, ah. not for research, Right. Because it is different to cloud seeding, harp is different. Yes, it is. But using similar technology because uh, the cloud seeding is where they, they take planes above the stratosphere or above the clouds yep. and then sprinkle iodine and salt, isn't it, mixed together? Some, I can't remember. Some kind of like potion-y thing they drop onto the clouds. It's definitely iodine, yeah. But this is different. This is using electronic waves to like hit certain right. targets to... to create weather okay interesting well mind is open michelle mind is open. my mind is open too although i did do a little more digging and there are two hazard climatologists Alyssa hassan uh -huh. and kelsey ellis they say that the conditions that generated those tornadoes on december 10 were quite unique a powerful storm system came in from the central u.s it brought snow uh the south had record breaking like warm spell so warm air humid air coming up from the gulf of mexico storm system brought the cold they hit unstable atmospheric conditions happened smashed into each other warm dense air rose up and then as the warm air cooled down the moisture condensed into clouds and this caused huge storms and then combine this with the powerful winds and you've got tornadoes however you know, these climatologists give all the details on what happened, but what caused those unique conditions? Could it have been harp? I don't know. I'm just... We don't know. So, look, watch this space on weather control because I think there is something in this. And obviously, the US have got their eye on it as well because if you can, if you can control the weather, you have massive... Advantage. Some ultimate power. Who needs nuclear weapons? Absolutely. And look, My God. and I'm quite into this. So, you know, and I think I've been a very good weather girl right now. So if you, so if good. you need, so good. if anyone's out there looking for a weather girl, I think I'd be quite good at that. Michelle, here she here is. I am. I'm open and available. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Mish. Yeah. That's incredible. You got the vibes. You got the vibes. I get the vibes. 
Well, Michelle, obviously you've gone off on a tangent about the weather and that's great, but we wanted to do this episode because it was supposed to be Christmassy, but moving away from the puke and shit as per Natalie's request. Yes. So that's why we've gone back to <laughs> things that might happen that might be paranormal or different over Christmas time because it's almost Christmas. And that made me think about Santa and his little sleigh in the sky. And that's why we're looking at UFOs, because like you said before, a lot of things in the sky around this time of year yeah. and if you take a look at the national archives which i did there are so many reports through the years of lights in the sky at christmas and like i said the ministry of defense store all their information at the national archives did you know that up until 2007 the ministry of defense was receiving around 150 reports of ufo sightings every year this figure doubled in 2008 and increased again to more than 600 in 2009. But even so, they've wrapped it up now. They're not interested anymore. But maybe they will on the back of what the US has just passed. Who knows? So this National Archive, is that just UK? Yeah. Right. It's the UK. Okay. Because yeah. I'm talking about local to me sightings okay. on Christmas Eve. Yeah. So on Christmas Eve... In 2008, which was, as I've just said, you know, that was during the period of time where the Ministry of Defence was actually logging all of the info. Yeah. There were, on Christmas Eve, reports of 15 red flickering lights coming in from Wickham, which is, in, I think that's in Buckinghamshire, and also from Rottingdean in Sussex, where 15 bright lights were also reported coming in from the Downs. So that's travelled quite a large area. Yeah. I wanted to tell you, we've mentioned this before, there's the Long Man of Wilmington, which is one of those ancient Iron Age chalk drawings oh, into the ground okay. around this area. It's near Eastbourne and it's ancient from the Iron Age. And there's also nearby on the Downs or near the Downs, another one called the Littlington White Horse, which is also, I think that's made of stone and it's a bit younger than the Long Man. But I'm wondering, is that some kind of landing strip? to these aliens oh. potentially do you think they're mm. sort of um way markers so they could be so they use them as as their kind of landmarks and it's could some be. kind of yeah ley line who knows wow good theory well the thing is in the in this country in the british isles no matter where you see a sighting of ufos there's probably going to be some kind of ancient landmark that no one <laughs> knows about because it was pre pre-internet yeah. But anyway, so going going on, uh, there was the BBC website that had a bunch of reports throughout 2008 and 2009, all through the year where there was processions of lights, usually burnt orange, but no explanation. 2009, somebody wrote in to report an orange red ball over Suffolk. Okay. And on Christmas Day itself, there's been numerous sightings through the years. Okay. Like, for example, in 2008, very strong year of it, there was one over Perth in Scotland. There's also one in Coventry with orange lights and tail flame of kind of streaking behind. And then in Glastonbury, there were two reports of bright red lights. So that's all in the same time frame. Yeah. So 2008, I wonder what we, we yeah. could look back and see if there's any anything weird going on. Exactly. Well, it goes on and on. I mean, I could go on because there are so many around Christmas Eve through to Boxing Day. But the most famous one of all, and you found out this at one point as well, I know you did, is the 1980, 26th to the 28th of December famous incident, also in Suffolk, Rendlesham Forest, near an RAF base at Woodbridge, which is near to some friends of mine, and was being used by the US Air Force at that time. There were actually two twin bases. One was called Woodbridge and the other was called Bent Waters. And they're both based on or near Rendlesham Forest. Don't you find it interesting that there is such a strong connection between the military and UFOs? Yes. This was what I was going to say before. Yes. Why is it always the military? I guess they have more planes in the sky and more more advanced... Technology to be able to, equipment. to view and see and capture and... To view and it, yeah. I don't, I don't know, but it seems like whenever there's a military base, there's UFO activity. So. Always. Well, anyway, so this is known as Britain's Roswell. And we all know about mm -hmm. Roswell in the United States. It's where apparently there's this famed, possibly true, possibly not, crash landing of UFO. And they actually did alien autopsies, they reckon. But there's never been any 
evidence of that reverse engineering aliens we we did do this again before didn't we we talked about well, that guy we have What's but we never we've remember. never talked about roswell specifically but no we haven't do you do know that even if there was an alien cut up somewhere that the general public would never ever know about it they're gonna cover that know. shit not up even a whiff. for sure yeah they're not gonna put that out there they're not so anyway eyewitnesses from the event have spoken about noises like a woman screaming during the during the event which was passed off as deer and lights in the forest which were also passed off as coming from the nearby Orford Ness lighthouse or even a local farmhouse okay. farm animals were heard to be going nuts for two nights afterwards and at the end of this the ministry of defense mod was accused of not taking the incident seriously some explanations of this was that it was a prank or even downed russian spyware but there is a report from a Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt of the United States Air Force, who was the commander at the time. I think he was number two on the base. And this memo can be seen all over the internet, but actually it, my one originated from the National Archives. So I'm going to read it to you now. Sure, go. Just very quickly. It's, it's from the Department of the Air Force. It was written on the 13th of January, 1981. So it's two weeks after the event, which did cause some consternation amongst debunkers and whatnot but he's written you in would his think, memo well, why didn't you write it the night after why'd you wait two weeks yeah, but exactly. we all know that it's a, it's a lot of bigger questions. it's christmas yeah. and new year and christmas everyone's busy. busy yeah and if you say and if you're freaked yeah. out maybe you just need some time to gather your thoughts maybe you needed some time to settle in exactly so anyway he's written the uh the title of this memo is called unexplained lights raf forward slash cc memo says early in the morning of 27th of December 1980 at approximately 3 a.m. two U.S. Air Force security police patrolmen saw unusual lights outside the back gate at RAF Woodbridge. Thinking an aircraft might have crashed or been forced down, they called for permission to go outside the gate and investigate. The on-duty flight responded, flight chief responded and allowed three patrolmen to proceed on foot. The individuals reported seeing a strange glowing object in the forest. Remember that. Put a pin in that, Michelle. <laughs> the object was described as being metallic in appearance and triangular in shape, approximately two to three metres across the base and approximately two metres high. It illuminated the entire forest with a white light. The object itself had a pulsing red light on top and a bank of blue lights underneath. The object was hovering or on legs. As the patrolman approached the object, it manoeuvred through the trees and disappeared. At this time, the animals on a nearby farm went into a frenzy. The object was briefly sighted approximately an hour later near the back gate. Two. The next day, three depressions, one and a half inches deep and seven inches in diameter, were found where the object had been sighted on the ground. The following night, 29th of December 1980, the area was checked for radiation. Beta gamma readings of 0.1 millirundgrens. What? I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> Todd Rundgren. Rundgrens <laughs> were recorded with the peak readings in the three depressions and near the centre of the triangle formed by the depressions. A nearby tree had moderate 0.05 to 0.07 readings on the side of the tree toward the depressions. This is the final part of the memo. Later in the night, a red sunlight, sun-like light was seen through the trees. It moved about and pulsed. At one point, it appeared to throw off glowing particles and then broke into five separate white objects, then disappeared. Immediately thereafter, three star-like objects were noticed in the sky. Two objects to the north and one to the south all of which were about 10 degrees off the horizon. The objects moved rapidly in sharp angular movements and displayed red, green and blue lights. The objects to the north appeared to be elliptical through an 8 to 12 power lens. I don't know what that is. They then turned into full turned full circles. The objects to the north remained in the sky for an hour or more. The object to the south was visible for two to three hours, then beamed down a stream of light from time to time. A little bit distressing, don't you yeah. think? Yeah. Numerous individuals, including the undersigned, that is, um, as I said before, Charles Holt, witnessed the activities in paragraphs two and three. So I then watched a YouTube video of an interview with Sergeant James Penniston, who was one of the men that was sent to the site on the first night, which is the 26th, 25th, 26th. Okay. Is this after the reports of a crash? Had they found the depressions at this point? 
No, they found, this is what they found. Right. This, he so saw he... the light. This is the first occasion, right? Peniston, Jim Peniston, Peniston. Not Cece's dad. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> finally, it's happened, happened to me. To me. <laughs> He was one of the men sent to the site after the reports of a crash in the forest. Do you remember that the men asked permission to go on foot to investigate? He was prepared for a crash site and recovery. But once he was there, he saw something that was so perplexing that he took a while to process it. In this interview, he worked with an animator who then did little pictures for me to watch and show exactly what it looked like. Okay. How many years after the fact? Because, you know, people's memories. A while. Yeah, I don't know. I know. I know. But at the time, they were all in agreement that they what they saw, including the very legitimate Holt, yeah. Colonel. Yeah, I mean, he's Lieutenant high up the Colonel ranks, Holt. right? Yeah, and very established and very commended. But anyway, this Peniston, Sergeant Jim Peniston, he saw, along with his colleagues, saw a bright light which dissipated to expose a black, shiny metal craft, as smooth as glass, and beneath the surface, it was marbling. So this bank of lights that Holt spoke about was actually more like, in the in the animation, looked like it was veins marbling oh. through and changing colours oh, wow. and things. So he said it was nine by nine feet. I don't know what that is in metres, but obviously we had Holt's interpretation, which was two to three metres. It was small. Very small, yeah. considering what you might think a crash, you know, an alien ship might be. Certainly in close encounters of the third kind, it was much bigger. Well, you think about your husband. He's six foot seven or something, isn't he? Yeah, well, the, it was as tall as seven foot. So it wasn't much taller than my husband. He's not six foot seven. Did you say he's six foot seven? Yeah. He's six foot five. Oh, sorry. All those two inches. Right. I guess two inches Six, count. seven is very big. <laughs> no, but you think about it. So it's slightly yeah, taller than tall. Paddy and... Only a bit yeah. longer. So really tight, yeah, teeny, tiny, tiny yeah. little thing. Very small. So smooth, black, shiny, but metallic glassy feel of it. Marbling lights glowing. There was a logo on the side. When when Sergeant Peniston what? noticed the logo, he was kind of like, oh, phew. Okay. It's so, not from another he was world. so confused and perplexed. I mean, he didn't even start thinking that yet. They were all like, oh. And the light was so bright in the beginning that they had to squint to see. And then eventually when it dissipated, then they saw this craft, okay. right? So the logo and the writing on the side was actually indecipherable. Oh. Like hieroglyphics. Oh, shit. Unfortunately. And as they approached the craft, they experienced physical changes. So, for example, before they approached the craft, they could hear all the sounds of the forest. It was like, you know, very early in the morning or late at night, yeah. that kind of time. It's still pitch black. Uh, they could hear all these sounds. But as they approached, suddenly it went pff, completely silent. Fuck. Deathly silent. I mean, we have to remember, this is before mobile phones. This is 1980. So they did not, they couldn't just whip out their iPhone and take a photo of those hieroglyphics. And the thing is, if they were so alien to your eyes, you wouldn't even be able to remember what they look like for sure. Well, we've spoken about this before. You know, you get so confused when you see something that just doesn't compute. I mean, I couldn't even remember those things on I'm a Celebrity, just a a code for the Wi-Fi. (laughs) So I'd never be able to remember. It went deathly silent. Then they felt this weird static across their skin and bodies. And it felt like they were in, moving in slow motion. <gasps> you said this on another episode. Do you remember? No. Okay, it doesn't matter. Oh, no, that was the, yeah, that was the incident at Fort Benning. Yes. Yeah, that was an amazing story. And this happened to them. This reminds me of this a lot, actually, the incident at Fort Benning, which is one of our episodes. Please go back and listen. It's very, very good, that one. It's a crazy fucking story. This is shades of that, for sure. Yes, it is. Absolutely. They felt like they'd examined the craft for about 45 minutes. And afterwards, their watches showed it was actually a couple of hours, (gasps) similar to Fort Benning, where they lost time. Fuck. Afterwards, they wrote their reports, but they were very understated. I mean, they did tell... Lieutenant Colonel Holt, of course, as their commanding officer. But when they wrote their reports, they were so frightened of losing their jobs that they really kind of toned it down and called it, rather than a UAP or a UFO, they called it a craft of unknown origin. Because you think about it, mental health as a topic for discussion was not something that happened back in 1980. You know, they could have just been branded lunatics, insane, and, and, Air Force. and Air Force, and and people wouldn't trust them, you know. So I can understand no. why they scaled it back. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, Sergeant Peniston and his colleagues experienced all sorts of emotions and feelings during the encounter. Confusion, fear, awe, and denial. And the craft's marbled colours became more agitated suddenly while they were watching it until... 
this bright white light began to come back again. Do you remember when it was when they arrived? It was so bright they could hardly look yeah. at it. This light became the, the colors went away. Suddenly it was masked again by this bright white light, and but they could still outline the triangular craft beneath yeah. it, and then it flew off, disappeared. Did a few other maneuvers and then disappeared. Fuck. Okay. But years later, in this YouTube video, Penniston has his own theory, which is that he feels that in retrospect, the craft was actually having engine trouble or something and was repairing itself. I actually believe that because, I mean, if that alien ship could just take the fuck off really fast, Mm. why would it let humans get that close to it unless there was some kind of damage from crashing landing whatever yeah. and they were trying to repair because it doesn't make any sense that they would let humans get that close to it and i'm thinking now are there tiny tiny aliens inside or is it controlled by someone's mind elsewhere or is it just a drone or something who knows anyway all kinds of stuff 20 hours later after peniston and the gang had this sighting 18 year old air force employee laurie Bowen, I'm going to call her, recalls seeing more lights during her midnight shift guarding the East Gate. Oh. Also, air traffic controllers at the base noted extremely fast moving objects on their radars. Okay, fuck. Bowen saw a ball of orange red light descend into the forest northwards of her post. Five of her senior colleagues also saw the lights and they all wondered if it was us crazy British celebrating New Year early. Right, okay, but no. No, no, sorry, At this, Laurie. This is the point where Colonel Holt was dragged out. What? He was located at a Christmas oh. party. He was dragged out of the party and urgently taken to view these lights. Half cut. So Smashed on eggnog. I don't know if he was half cut. Could have been. <laughs> could have been. But again, you have to remember the kind of man that, that Lieutenant Colonel Holt was. He wasn't the kind to jump to UFO conclusions and he had a strong track record in the military. Mm-hmm. He was no nonsense and he was quite irritated with the, with the stuff of being so dramatic and histrionic. So anyway, he went with a party into the forest with his dictaphone recording what he saw. There is 18 minutes of tape where Holt and his men are searching the forest and neighbouring farmland and he can be heard describing what he sees as he goes. Like he sees this orange red light hovering over the forest, zipping about at unimaginable speeds and directing beams down into the twin bases, which is really concerning for him in his military role. In the tape, you can hear him actually saying, it's back again. It's coming this way. There's no doubt about it. This is weird. It looks like an eye winking at you. It almost burns your eyes. This is what Penniston had said before as well. The white light was so bright that they could hardly look at it. He's coming towards us now was something else he was heard heard saying on the tape. But does it sound like someone, you know, having a, a prank, a Christmas prank, a, a joke, a hoax? Well, I don't know. It's a pretty big one. And would you include a lieutenant? colonel from the no. u.s air force on that prank lot to lose if if you were him and if it was a prank on him then you'd, you'd be fucked you wouldn't no, do no. that court martial no. so like i said before most concerning thing to halt was that the beams of light that the object was firing towards the ground and he said he heard this over his radio like he heard that elsewhere other parts of the base there were lights shining onto the ground okay so he it wasn't it just him on his radio him seeing this, it was across the base. Okay. Exactly. That's when the radio was working because that night, according to the eyewitnesses, the radios and the flashlights and the lights were intermittently working, Fuck. strangely. Okay. So yeah. communications interrupted. So over at Bent Waters, there was also these light beams being being recorded and now there's a serious security issue. So despite him being such a high-ranking and legitimate military man, and being one of the main eyewitnesses, there was still a cover-up, it's believed, by the military. The military who witnessed it believe that there was a cover-up by the military and CIA. So, for example, let me explain. Jim Penniston remembers being interviewed for hours by Army Intelligence and even given a truth serum drug, sodium pentothal, I think it's called. Fucking hell. Other witnesses, Mm. yeah, other witnesses say they were interrogated by CIA. Again, those two, like one's intelligence, one's the army intelligence. They've got their dirty little paws over everything, don't they? And this one guy was also forced to sign a false statement. 
So what has not been officially acknowledged, Michelle, is that nuclear weapons were being stored at the base. Like I said, this isn't official, which is a violation of the US and the UK's treaty obligations. And there were also rumours of highly dubious weapons in the storage areas in the neighbouring facility of Bentwaters. But you know what? That makes sense because why else a CIA on a UK military base? Yeah. So there's a lot of secrets happening here. Mm. And from our previous episodes involving the Australian government, particularly Gough Whitlam, our fave, we know that their, you know, secrets are abound. Anyway, the US was disinterested in this. There was a bit of a a struggle about who's going to take responsibility because it's on British soil. So eventually it was referred to the British Ministry of Defence, who also weren't too bothered and gave the conclusion as unexplained. But (laughs) is that because they weren't given all the information, Mish? Because suddenly, in the days post the sightings, suddenly a US Air Force commander-in-chief, a Commander A. Gabriel, made an unscheduled trip to Bentwaters. And he was briefed about the incident and then removed a large amount of evidence, most of which was never seen again. And the Ministry of Defence didn't know this. Hang on. So this guy's from... U.S. military? He's from the U.S. military. Yeah, Air Force. He took evidence. He Yeah, unscheduled trip to Bentwaters, turned up, takes evidence, pisses off. Do they know what he took? No. Mm. And again, a lot of this, uh, this information has kind of slipped out bits and pieces over the years. There's a lot of journalists on cold case inquiries right. and things. At the same time, Michelle, though, just so you don't know, you know it's not a prank, many locals independent of the military also reported sightings that night, those nights Mm -hmm. over the forest at the same time. In the same period as the Rendlesham incident, there was also sightings of a Russian satellite which burnt up over Western Europe and was widely reported as a UFO by many witnesses. Okay. Coincidentally, there was also the burning up of a meteor which occurred in the early hours of the 26th of December. And this produced an unusually bright fireball which was visible through southeast England. But... Most people think that that's separate from the incident, but is it connected somehow? Who knows? Joining the dots, we all like to do it. Whether or not there are any dots to be joined, I don't know. But these things do tend to come in a rash, you know, a little spate Mm. of bits and pieces. So maybe they are connected. I'm with you. I think there's a question mark over it. Keep keep your minds open. Yeah. Well, this was never mentioned either in any of the original documents, but there was a 20-year-old airman called Larry Warren. I just thought he was um, a little excited by the event. Okay. Because he, he says he was present on the third night during Colonel Holt's investigation in Rendlesham, but his version is very different, Michelle. But is he public or military? Military. He was serving at the time. Larry Warren claims that he saw the investigation party conversing with actual alien beings at the crash site. What? And it goes on to say he was brainwashed by men in black style interrogators in an underground facility at the base. The official witnesses don't recall him being there, but he was serving on the base at the time. Right. So there's also a few discrepancies. And like you said, time does change your memory somewhat. Peniston says that... He had a notebook, which he wrote everything down in, but his colleagues don't recall him writing every, anything down at all. And he also said at some point that when he touched the craft, he received a telepathic message in binary code. But he never mentions that in the videos that I've seen of him talking. And also his colleague who was there, John Burroughs, doesn't remember him doing any of that stuff. Okay. But... And there's no mention of that on the radio conversations going back and forth to base, which they were conducting throughout. Because if you touched it, you'd be like, fuck, I just touched it. Oh, I've just got a message. Message from the aliens. Yeah. Like you would. Yeah, no, his colleagues don't remember that. But this is kind of mm. flourished later on. Right. Whether it was just not mentioned because of the embarrassment factor. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? But here's a fun fact, Michelle. Oh, I love a did fun you fact. Know, <laughs> did you know that Prince Philip was a UFO enthusiast? What? No. Prince Philip, the dead one. Yeah. The dead I shouldn't say that. Oh, I shouldn't say that. The recently deceased Rip Prince Philip. Yes, yes. Rip. He collected stories of UFO sightings by the RAF and he was fascinated with Rendlesham in particular. And he spent the summer of 2019. Ooh. So that's what, a year before he died? A year or two? When did he die? This year? I thought 2020, but I don't know. When was it? Well, I'll look it up. Anyway, recent. It was recent. It was recent. So... In the last years before his death, he spent a whole summer reading The Holt Perspective, which is by Charles Holt, 
the lieutenant who wrote the original report. But I do know that for many years he could not speak about it. And if he did, he had to, this is Holt I'm talking about, while he was still serving and recent retiree, whenever he spoke publicly about it, he sought permission before doing so. Right. Okay. But then he must have written a book called The Holt Perspective. That smacks of some kind of cover-up if you have to have permission. Yeah. And also, Michelle, in the pictures of Holt, the like the latest pictures that I've seen of him years later, he is wearing a space tie, a tie with <laughs> planets on. And I wasn't sure if that just undermined absolutely all of that, you know, belief in him as a solid eyewitness, no nonsense military man. But he is retired and maybe his wife gave him the tie and he will, I mean, you don't know why he's wearing a crazy tie, a goofy tie. I don't know. Maybe. Perhaps the incident at Rendlesham completely changed him. Well, it kind of would, you would think, you know. Yeah. There's something else, Michelle. I have, as you know, listened to a lot of podcasts about uh, Rendlesham and other incidences like this. Okay. And I can't remember whether whether it was Joe Wood's fantastic alien oh. podcast, which is no longer going. Yeah, it's a shame. What was it called? I believe. Is it Alien Nation? Alien Nation. Yeah. I believe. <laughs> I believe. <laughs> or if it was one of those podcast originals. But I do recall hearing a story, and I, I can't find it on the internet no matter how hard I look, about campers who were camping in Rendlesham Forest around that time. But if it was Christmas, who the fuck, apart from my husband, camps in the <laughs> middle of winter? People like your husband. That's who. Exactly. It's a group of young kids, not kids, but they were 20 something or younger and their watches all stopped and weird things happened. And one of them was abducted. And I can't remember the story, but it was fascinating. Do you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to do some scouring. I'm going to duck, duck, go that. I'm going to Duck, duck, go the shit out of those keywords and I'm going to find it and I'm going to put it in the show notes, people. People! Listen to me! People! Don't do that. People! People. Told you, people. People! Scary stuff. People! People. (gasps) Amazing, my God. Yep, and that's my story about Rendlesham. You know what? Because I had come across Rendlesham, but... Didn't know the ins and outs of it. So that's yeah. that's amazing. And it really feeds into that whole cover up, military, something's going on. Connect the dots with what's happening right now with declassified mm. info coming out from the Pentagon this yeah. year. Now they've started a whole new office in the States. Something is afoot. I don't know what. I wonder... Once the UK gets their shit together, loses Boris and starts focusing well, on be real matters, apart from Christmas parties, <laughs> perhaps we will open a similar kind of office. Maybe. the eavesdropping UFO oh, dailies. Do you think we're going to head up the office? Maybe. I would <laughs> love that. I would love it. Are we going to be put in charge of the, U- the UK arm of the UFO spotting official Maybe. Department. But you know what would be even more exciting? Okay, here's what I want for Christmas, people. People. God. People. I don't know. Here's what I'd like for Christmas. Any TV producers out there who want eavesdrop and duo to investigate the paranormal, get in touch. What oh. What an amazing Christmas gift that would be to us and to the world, Jordan. I'm a bit worried about that, Michelle, because I don't want to be put in a situation where we're having to stay overnight in a haunted castle, whether I believe in ghosts or not. Look, we'll be fine. I'll protect you, Jordy. I'll protect you. All oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, five foot nothing. She'll protect me. I'm a bloody giant next to you. You'll use me as a human shield. Well, yeah, obviously. <laughs> no. Look, I think there's something to all of this. There are loads of things that have been happening this December. You know, there was a a UFO in New Jersey where, again, UFO sightings daily dot com blogged the shit out of this. So it was on December ten. There were some people who, by the sounds of it, they were having a jolly little get wild. together. Yeah, a wild, not socially distanced party. Absolutely not. You hear it. I mean, it's this five minute long clip of these lights in the sky and they are freaked out because what they're seeing in the sky are basically these glowing orbs and the the video is actually hilarious because you hear them there's this one guy's like 
that's a drone. And the other one's like, that ain't no goddamn drone. That With that red light, you crazy man. That's some fucking alien shit. And they talk like <laughs> this the whole way through. But there's a guy filming and he's like, oh, look at that. There's like five of them in the sky. And then he sort of pans over to the left and out of nowhere, about 20 more like this fucking <gasps> squadron oh of God. them just appear out of nowhere and they all start freaking out. You hear them and they're like, that ain't no stars, bruv. You know, the the lights are moving through the sky and then they sort of start coming towards them. And that's when, oh, and they shit. start going like above them and they start freaking out even more. And then whoever's filming zooms in. It's like this perfect sphere. I mean, it's beautiful but really baffling because like there's no logical explanation for what these things are in the sky and I'll link to it in the show notes and the thing is that two days earlier in Fort Worth in in Texas there was a report again of this tiny white orb in the sky that looks exactly like the ones from New Jersey so something is going on right now something's up and it ain't Santa It ain't Santa. Is there a number we can call? UFO busters. (laughs) That's who you call. There must be somewhere. I mean, I know it doesn't exist anymore, but there was the hotline that you used to be able to call. Hello. We need one. I'd like to be able to report in. Well, do you know what? You can email this UFO daily or sightingsdaily.com. Okay. Because, I mean, he gets a lot of his stuff from MUFON, but people do just contact him. I thought MUFON didn't exist anymore. No, it does. I think Kufon is oh, okay. it Kufon doesn't exist. One of them, Mufon and oh, okay. Kufon right. okay. and and what does he do? He he gets a lot of his info from Mufon. Did you yes, say yes? But he also is pretty stringent. It seems about only putting stuff that is what he, what yeah he that has some legs to it, and he pops it all on there. And do you know what? Like a lot of the big news outlets around the world use him as a, a source. So really interesting Ah. so yeah there you go something's going on people amazing look in the sky because something's something's happening and if it's not santa and it's not just santa no it's not his reindeers but it could be could be so with that in mind we would like to wish you all a very merry happy holidays as some people say in parts of the world merry christmas buon natale feliz navidad and what else is there? Uh, I don't know. Have a bonza Christmas in Australia. Yeah, have a have a ripper, or a ripper Christmas. <laughs> throw throw a prawn on the barbie. Open an oyster in Australia. Yeah. All the things that you like to do. I just hope that everybody is happy, content, and with their families, and not freaking out over the lights in the sky or COVID. And we will s- <laughs> uh, or COVID. Will the next one be in? the new year our next is this, is this the last one for the year no there's a we will be doing a really special new year's episode so we've got a surprise for you all so make sure you tune in oh yes you must tune in and in the meantime look up look up in the skies we want to see we want you to get in touch look up. let us know if you see anything in the sky post your videos tell us what's going on but also Wherever you are, whatever you do, just, just keep, keep eavesdropping. 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 Eavesdropping.